Um, so to get started, uh, why don't each one of you tell us a little bit about yourselves, uh, your backgrounds, and specifically kind of how your firm is playing in the alternative data space. Bill, why don't we start with you? Sure, I'm, I'm uh, Bill Pecorello. I'm the founder and CEO of Consumer Edge Research. I started out, uh, for about 20 years, I was a sell side analyst, starting at Sanford Bernstein and then Morgan Stanley. I founded Consumer Edge Research 10 years ago as an equity research boutique, and we always had a lot of data in our process. From Bernstein to Morgan Stanley to Consumer Edge, what happened was clients started demanding more and more data from us. Can we have that exhibit from that report, page 23? Can we have it on these other 10 companies? Can we have it whenever we want it, any way we want it? So we started building more automated tools to deliver the data to them. About two years ago or so, I started a separate division, Consumer Edge Insight, totally focused on alternative data. There we started moving into data that was much larger in scale, credit card transaction data, to be particular, and then other data sets we added. So we're dealing with terabytes of data. We needed data scientists, software engineers. So the model was evolving, but it totally layered on to consumer research is doing business with 300 of the largest institutional investors in the world. So we already have the relationship. We know the stocks, we know the consumer area, and we're able to layer the data on to make use and sense of the data, which was key. So the clients trust us, they know we know the domain, and then how do we take the data, and, and that's really where the business is going, and the majority of our growth is coming on the data side today. Oh, great, thanks. Uh, I'm Robert Fagan uh, with Cowan. Uh, we had a very similar experience uh, to Bill. So um, I run research at Cowan, and uh, again, starting a couple years ago, uh, clients started asking for some of the data that was underpinning our research. And we started a separate division, a subsidiary called Kyber Data Science. Um, and Kyber is designed to uh, commercialize and monetize uh, some of our internal data assets. Uh, we're also working with a few select third parties uh, to do the same. Uh, similar to what Bill said, you know, we, our DNA, we come at it from uh, the perspective of really knowing the financial customer, even though we sell data to the, uh, uh, to the corporate world as well. But we come at it from the perspective of understanding uh, what the buy side needs, um, how they pick stocks, and how the data could be useful, and um, layer on the, uh, the data science knowledge on top of it. Great. Thanks, Robert. So I'm Tim Baker. I'm the head of Refinitiv Labs at uh, uh, Refinitiv is a spin out from Thomson Reuters. So it's the data business selling into the buy side and the sell side. Uh, and I have a research background, worked many years at UBS and Swiss Bank before that. Uh, what we do in our team is we do a lot of vetting of alternative data sources. And uh, we also have a team called the Starmine team out in San Francisco. And they're deriving a lot of data, a lot of uh, predictive analytics on the back of third-party data and, and data that we have internally. So, for example, we take the IBIS uh, data and then we create a smart estimate out of it. Um, so kind of operating at a slightly different level, but we are, I think, like most, most platform companies, also looking at how alternative data can be put onto our platforms, which is where, you know, typically the quants, they use QA Direct, for example, one of our products, or uh, Data Stream, which is where we've got millions of time series. So I think it's a case of you've got a new signal. How does that line up to macro data or earnings data? Great. And, and I did want to step in for a second and uh, tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, Integrity Research is a firm that I founded about 15 years ago. And kind of the, the angle that we're taking to this whole space is for the past 15 years, we've been uh, identifying, vetting, and recommending unique data research and analytics sources to asset managers. So we have been working with uh, small hedge funds to some of the largest asset managers in the world, really uh, discovering data sets and recommending them. So we were doing alt data before it was alt data. Um, but we also uh, write a lot about the research and the analytics and the alternative data space. So um, probably many of you have received our uh, e-zine or our subscribers to our service. And th so that's the kind of the angle that, that we're coming at uh, the space from. So, in your minds, guys, um, what 
do you think are some of the greatest values of alternative data for an asset manager in the process? Sure. Uh, you know, having been an analyst myself for, for two decades, data is really part of the process now, and it's, an, it's a necessity. And I think about it as you think about the toolkit. You're analyzing the financial statements. You're talking to the management of the companies. You might be meeting with competitors, suppliers, et cetera. But talking to the data is, has to be part of that process, and I would not want to be without it. But the challenge is, is that there's an incredible amount of noise. There's a flood of data, hundreds of data sets out there. And then how you make sense of it, what data you can trust. So it's really, uh, you know, there's the signal kind of pure quant type model. But when you talk about picking stocks and the investment process, it has to be one input to the process, uh, which has still all those other ingredients to it. But it's, it's an ingredient that I want, wouldn't want to be without. And really the way it's being used now is you can think about, you know, what are the KPIs? Every company has certain KPIs. It's not just sales. There might be the margins, customer retention, uh, repeat purchase, everything that you can, uh, what you need to get at the margin structure, everything else, and data is part of that. And if used correctly, can help give you insights and create alpha. Beyond just the signal of, uh, am I getting a signal here that says buy or sell? How do I work this in? And it's much more complex because a signal that was working in the past might not be working in the future for many reasons. Something might have changed at the company or within the data, and you're going to find out about that when it's too late. Right. So uh, you really have to understand how to use the data and how it fits in with how does this drive with what I'm hearing from the company and, and the other stuff that I'm doing. Right, right. Tim, do you, do you have uh, anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, Bill, you covered quite a lot of it. I mean, I, I see alternative data as just a new piece of the mosaic, right? I think any good analyst was doing what we used to call channel checking. Now there's electronic ways of collecting that data. And I think to your point, it's a case of how you stitch that data together. I think there are a few content sets out there that I think the hedge funds are probably still paying up, you know, multi-million dollar uh, price tags for, you know, where perhaps the efficient uh, market hypothesis is kind of at its extreme and they can maybe get some information edge. But I, you know, I tend to feel that this data has to be worked into lots and lots of other data sets. And I think even firms like Two Sigma, they're adding this data on top of piles and piles of other data and looking for a slight improvement in alpha. Um, so you know, I, I, I think they're the main two use cases. Um, and that's pretty much it. Right. You know, one of, one of the great myths in the alternative data space and, uh, is that you can have one data set and that's the golden bullet, and, and you're gonna generate alpha from that, uh, from that one data set. Clearly, what you guys have been saying is that's actually not the case. And so if, if you could um, take us through some complementary data sets to some of the data sets you offer um, to help the audience better understand how data sets work together to help asset managers get at the answer. Uh, so Robert, how about you? Yeah, so I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, r really for two reasons. One is, um, at least today, every type of data has an inherent flaw. It doesn't necessarily check every single box. So if you're using credit card data, it can be extremely powerful, um, but it also has holes uh, or blind spots. You know, what happens when you go to McDonald's and you pay cash? You're just not capturing that. So you can use a complementary data set like a survey or um, other types of uh, consumer-oriented uh, tools to uh, conjoin, hopefully, uh, if the data is clean enough, or at least get another perspective on what's going on in the marketplace to make sure that it's uh, very informed. Uh, another example is, what do you do about international? So it all comes back for, for, the, for financial analysts, for portfolio, for portfolio managers, it comes down to how tightly can I correlate this data to a stock? That's, that's really what it comes down to. So another blind spot might be international sales. So things might be fantastic in the US, you're missing something in Europe, you might need another data set to help you fill it in there. So uh, the other thing I would say is that the more people that have a data set, the harder it is to generate alpha from right. it, um, which is a bit of a double-edged sword. So. Um, you know, that, that's a much longer question um, and has to do much more with asking the right questions of the data 
rather than just taking in everything and hoping that you generate some alpha. Right, right. We found with our, our credit card, you know, credit card transaction day is a great data set to anchor with, but you need other data sets to complement it. So, yeah, the example, you're not capturing cash. I can give you an example of where, let's say, uh, a Costco, they changed their credit card from American Express to Visa. So the geolocation data will help capture what's going on at Costco or the private card at Home Depot. You might have the MasterCard Visa, not the private card, but the geolocation data is getting you the Home Depot. Uh, it, it refines the data because you have the traffic. Hotels, you go to a, you, the Hilton Hotel, hits your card in January, you take the vacation in July, the company books the revenue in July. The geolocation data captures July when they enter the hotel. Um, SKU level data. We don't know what they buy when they went into Macy's or Home Depot. So email receipt data and uh, point of sale data gets you down at the brand and SKU level data. Survey data, what were they thinking? Browsing data, what, uh, uh, predictive. They were searching on Home Depot's site and didn't show up there for four weeks. So all of that complements it. Right. One, one of the new topics that I've been uh, hearing a lot more about is about the, uh, the knowledge graph. And um, uh, I, I'm not smart enough to purport to even understand what it, what it means. Tim, can you talk us through a little bit about um, um, your knowledge graph and how asset managers might use that um, in their investment process? Yeah, sure. So uh, for those of you who don't know knowledge graph, you think, if you think about the social graph, that's what Facebook uses, uh, or what Facebook uses to connect you to potential friends, basically. It's just a model of connections between different things. The refinitive knowledge graph connects uh, makes several billion connections between companies, uh, the markets they trade in, the securities they've issued, the officers and directors that work there, many, 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 many other types of, of entities. Um, we were pretty early with Knowledge Graph. I think we came out with the Knowledge Graph uh, about a year ago. And actually, we built it almost by accident. We'd been kind of remastering our data and done a pretty good job of kind of connecting entity data together. And uh, when we launched the product, a lot of people said, well, how can we use this as in the investment process? A year later, we've now got, it's almost like there's a, you know, a huge adoption of knowledge graphs. Starts with the hedge funds. You know, we're then basically using a knowledge graph to help make more sense of their time series data. If you can model how interconnected the world of finance is and the world of commerce is, then it's going to give, give you a better chance of understanding potential outcomes. So if a customer goes bankrupt, what is the knock-on effect on a, a listed company? If a, co if a company is sanctioned, then what's the potential impact of that, uh, on that company? So doing analytics, once you've organized your data into this connected world and you start to combine it with event data, you can start to model the potential impact on a portfolio. So that's one of the big use cases. It's also used by firms like Google to enable search. So once you've created a knowledge graph, you can also drive a much more semantic search experience. So Wellington, for example, uses our intelligent tagging platform and a, and a semantic approach to help their portfolio managers find data and find, to find research. And we are seeing a kind of an explosion in use cases. It's very early, but I think now tools and database technologies like Neo4j and Amazon Neptune are really now helping to fuel that adoption. Uh, but the hard thing with the knowledge graph is getting started, right? Building that core list of entities and those connections. So I see the refinitive knowledge graph as being that seed crystal that customers can, can ingest, we maintain it, and then they adorn that with their holdings and other data. Maybe they'll take some of your data build, for example, and attach that and use that to drive their proprietary um, investment process. Right. So, Robert, I know one of the ki kinds of data that you folks market is crude oil inventory data um, generated by, uh, from satellites. Uh, what are some of the big questions that asset managers ask about both the data, kind of the process of collection, et cetera? Yeah, so if you look at surveys, satellite is not as large a factor um, in alternative data compared to other forms of, of data right now. Um, you know, first, I think there's some product confusion. There are a lot of vendors um, selling satellite stuff, and that sort of confuses the market. Also, um, you have to be able to successfully map imagery to stocks and make specific stock calls versus, you know, looking at 
uh, giant oil fields. Um, and I think also one of the other factors uh, that's limited it so far is the newness of it. So there's not a lot of data history uh, with satellite, which is necessary for, for most uh, bisiders and, and so forth. So it's definitely, I'm glad we have the tool. It's something that you know we, we continue to experiment with because it holds some promise, but um, you know today it's being adopted more slowly than, than other sorts of data. What I will say is that it's great for a snapshot. It's great for uh, your mosaic. Um, you know, what does production look like versus a few months ago? Um, you know, what activity is on the ground today versus last week? Um, it's a very good enhancement to data. Um, right now, I wouldn't put it in the category of big data, meaning massive data sets. I would put it in the category more of sort of confirmatory of um, trends that you're seeing through other data. So, so Bill, um, you know, I know that um, one of the data sets that you folks um, have been using and, and have uh, been marketing is credit card transaction data. There are a number of different sources of credit card transaction data out there. So what are the key differentiators that an asset manager needs to consider when they look at these various sources? Yeah, credit card data is one of the most used across the, uh, the buy side and has been so for uh, really up to uh, 10 years. Uh, so when we uh, came out with our product, uh, you know, really coming from that fundamental background, uh, what you have to think about, this is massive amounts of data. Number one, how representative is the data of what's really happening? So geographic skews, demographic skews. Are you missing rural areas? Are you missing parts of the country? Or is your data skewing to older consumers or higher income consumers? So how representative is the panel? Then behind the scenes, there's the cleaning of the data. So not all data is the same. So for example, uh, we have the transaction date. A lot of the other data out there relies on a post date. When you're aligning with the fiscal quarters of a company, when you're looking at a holiday promotional period or a shift, that type of thing, the tra transaction date is kind of important to know it. Right. Um, the other thing would be what other, to get at insights, what other data can you attach to the credit card data? So in our case, we've attached demographic data initially before the geolocation data we announced this week. So demographic data really starts to give you demographic, gives you fundamental insights, right? So uh, people are no longer going to Lululemon and they're shopping online at Amazon. What part of the country is this happening and what demographic group is it happening in, et cetera. So to get the kind of questions you want to ask of the companies. So, um, when you panelize the data, all the stuff that's happening before an asset manager can trust the data, how's it being cleaned, how's it being panelized, and then there's other value add. How's it being serviced and distributed? In what way do I consume this data? How do I work it into my investment process? If it comes in really clunky and I can't work it into my process, so all of that, and then who, when, I, when I want to understand something, who do I pick up the phone and talk to about how do I use this data? Why is this right? It's showing me this. Does that make sense? Am I interpreting this correctly? So there's a lot of ways to differentiate across all those dimensions. Right. So, so um, I have a number of other questions for the panel, but I'd like to open it up at this moment. If anyone in the audience has a question, uh, we'll take some questions now. Oh, yep. I'm starting to like form a question in my brain. I don't know the exact question, right? But it seems like the last couple of days have really been focused on the buyers, potential buyers and users of this data. But at the end of the day, those buyers and users of the data are marketing to a set of investors that their value add is, I know how to read this data, I know what data to choose, I found it, I'm using it correctly. Are you guys finding the, the, the end conversation with the users? Like, is that happening? Is there some form of this data, this information, these questions should be getting to the people that are hiring the managers using this? Mm -hmm. is, this is, it, is it starting some type of thought in your brain? Right, right, so, so clearly, um, if, if, you're, if you're an allocator and you're looking at a bunch of funds and, and they're uh, saying, oh yeah, we're using alternative data or whatever, how do you, how do you know um, whether or not they're actually, they're, they're actually using, it's, it's for real, and that they're, um, they're using a, a real process that are gonna generate alpha? Is that, is that kind of where you're going? And using the right process, and now we've got all these ESG investors, and suddenly yesterday, some, I think someone from Thompson spoke about the concept of, you know, are we getting this in an ethical fashion, right? I mean, investors are now starting to care about that aspect. Of right. Problem. It seems like that last leg to the investors hasn't really, you know, right. we haven't gotten there. And I think what you're alluding to is the market's been somewhat supply-driven, 
And you know, I get you know, firms coming in every couple of weeks saying, I've got this amazing new data set. And you go, OK, uh, what's the universe of companies or securities? And it's like four companies. How much history do you have? It's, well, we've got kind of a year, kind of maybe. Uh, do you own the data? Have you cleared with your customers that you can do anything with that data? Um, is there PII in the data? Um, and very, very often you end up with, come back in eight years when you've <laughs> recontracted you know, the, with, your, with your customers so you can use this data, you figured out how to normalize the data. I mean, I think the better use cases is where you've got an investment thesis about a company. You probably get this all the time, you know, both of you actually, and the customer coming to you saying, I'm trying to get to the bottom of whether, or well, my investment thesis is um, that um, you know, the, the F-150 is going to take a dive because of this demographic shift. I want to be able to test that hypothesis. Let's go and find out, find some data. Now, that, that's not a marketplace. It's very hard to build a marketplace. And this is what this, this whole industry, this little segment of the information industry is struggling with, which is, how do you kind of scale what is essentially a highly handcrafted, curated set of content? Um, we as a platform company are, are trying to figure that out. And it's most likely we'll be taking data from these guys after it's been curated and there will be an active market. I don't know whether that kind of got to the question. The okay. So okay. <laughs> that was my interpretation of your question. <laughs> right. So, so clearly, one of the barriers to actually implementing and adopting alternative data are some of the compliance risks around, uh, around alternative data use. Um, if you guys could uh, address what are some of the biggest compliance risks you see, particularly around the kind of data that you're involved with, right? Um, so we can share some of those stumbling blocks with the audience. Sure. The, um, and coming from a, you know, a Two, the two decades on the, on the sell side, uh, you know, a highly regulated environment, it's good to uh, enter the data business with that as a backdrop uh, because you, you have to be buttoned down in compliance. Of course, MNPI, uh, without saying, um, there's no material and in non-public information that you that, that's deemed that that you can pass on, but also uh, privacy and third-party data rights are two of the biggest things. Third-party data rights go without saying, do you have the rights all the way up the chain to take this data and to provide it to an investor. Do you have the rights to do that? But privacy is becoming obviously a much, much bigger issue. And the percentage of, you know, when we do a compliance call, let's say it's 30 to 60 minutes before onboarding a data set, the percentage of the time that is now allocated to privacy has really ballooned in recent months, especially after everything with Facebook, et cetera. And uh, with the, Europe, the European regulations, and we, we assumed before we entered the market that the privacy uh, rules and regulations are going to evolve in the U.S. to at least, you know, where they are in Europe. We have to operate under that assumption. And um, we've adopted, you know, it's put as much effort into it as we did cleaning and, and delivering the data. Um, there's something called differential privacy that we put on the, so you cannot, even if you don't give PII, to the customer that they can't, with what you gave them, reverse engineer who an individual is. Because you can, you can do it. Uh, even though you stripped out their name and address, you can figure out who that individual is. It's been proven. So differential privacy, which is used by Apple and others, and wasn't used by Facebook, uh, is something that is another layer of protection uh, on there. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. It's not just, is it material non-public information, but could you potentially even derive material non-public information from it? So, uh, you know, we, we've had, for example, geolocation vendors come in and say, you know, not only can I show you, you know, what's there, but I can tell you who it is. And the way they do it is, for example, where is your cell phone sleeping at night? Right, so all of a sudden they can match that data. We don't want to take delivery of that data. Uh, we also don't want to give the customers the ability to reverse engineer into it. Um, and it can be a little bit scary. But the, the good news is I think people are very focused on this. And particularly our customers are extremely focused on this. Uh, they don't want to come anywhere near that sort of thing. Um, so, so um Robert, Cowan uh, decided to um, open up 
fiber um, data science. And clearly, you're seeing more and more sell-side firms um, looking at the alternative data space as an interesting uh, place to go. Talk us through kind of some of the rationale as to why Cowan decided to do this now. Um, well, we, we started to do it now because of customer demand. Yeah. So, you know, our job is to delight the customer, and that's what they were looking for, and so that's what we did. Um, in terms of structure, why did we set it up as a separate subsidiary? Um, you know, first is to isolate it as a startup, um, you know, and fund it and staff it accordingly. Um, it has a different time horizon than some of our other businesses, and as a public company, it's nice to be able to isolate uh, that investment. Um, second is independence, right? Um, in some cases, the buy side does not want uh, to access data through the sell side, and um, so structurally, that was important. Also, the ability to address the corporate market um, and have a sales force that can address not just the buy side, but also the corporate market. Um, and, and like I said, it's, it's a different sales cycle. It's a longer sales cycle. Um, and in some cases, it also addresses how the buy side wants to pay for the data. Um, some, some on the buy side want to pay through, uh, you know, through uh, soft dollar, but some want to pay for it as a subscription. So creating that flexibility is helpful. Right, right. So, so Tim, uh, a number of firms, uh, you know, FactSet, NASDAQ, et cetera, have uh, recently come out with um, alternative data marketplaces, platforms. Um, you know, clearly, um, and, and we're not expecting you to give us any scoop on, on what uh, um, Refinitiv is, is coming out with uh, next week, but if you can talk us through kind of um, that strategy, do you think it works? Uh, you know, what are the, the big issues to, uh, for that kind of uh, a strategy to succeed? I guess the first thing is that the economics of this business are still quite uncertain. You know, I think that when you think of very scarce data having a very high value, as soon as you start to commoditize that data, the value goes down. And I think with any marketplace, what you have to do is get that balance right and then bring buyers and sellers together in a place where they can do their business. Um, the way that we look at that is, We've got huge amounts of reference data, as I mentioned, QAD, data stream. It's all in the cloud now. So our hypothesis is our customers are going to want their old data alongside that data. So that we're, we're working on how we can make that as seamless as possible. You know, I think there are, there are some firms out there have got good, you know, private equity backing, and they'll get, have a good run at, um, you know, creating platforms from scratch. But I think the models that we've heard about today are really on the back of existing strong businesses where you've got access to the customer and distribution. And actually, you're bringing incremental value in terms of the curation of that data. And look, we've looked at a number of firms out there, um, and we've seen the financials of some of those firms, and the economics don't make sense. If you've got, you know, some of the, some of the aggregators will have 20 or 30 data scientists, and one or two or three million dollars of revenue that that will not sustain unless they can go through that you know that curve and i think it's i think it's tough without you know resting or riding on the back of a, of a big core business or a set of technologies um i think some firms out there you know there's firms like nasdaq that are having a run at this but i don't think it's their core competence so i think it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out um i think fact set obviously they've got a very strong buy side franchise but they're not, they don't have a big quant business. So I think that'll be interesting, but I think they're doing some things that make sense. And I think with any marketplace, you've got to create, you know, again, somewhere where buyers and sellers can meet and very easily transact. So doing this stuff in the cloud, making it the discovery of the content set quicker, making the economics attractive is also part of what, you know, what's got to be sold for. Great, thanks. Uh, so, before uh, my last question, I still want to open it up. Any uh, specific questions from the audience? Yes. So, uh, I think we've heard a lot about uh, people using alternative data to predict the movement of a specific stock. I'm wondering uh, what's being done in the space uh, on a macro level. Great. Uh, sort of uh, referring to sectors, indexes. Yep. Great. 
So, so the use of alternative data more for macro types of issues versus stock specific issues. Yeah. We're being asked about that and we're building out macro specific products because we're, you know, the consumer being two thirds of the economy, we're capturing all this consumer data. So we've taken it all now by sub industry and macro. So let's say travel and leisure is the macro industry, quick serve restaurants is the sub industry, one of many in the travel leisure segment. And, um, and when you're blending other macro data with this, because we're getting, you know, the government might be releasing certain statistics once a month, they're surveying, you know, 50, 60,000 retailers, but we're getting almost in real time millions of consumers that we can get what's happening um, in the high income group, what's happening in Texas, what's happening in the travel leisure segment. Restaurants are a leading indicator of the economy. Even within the restaurant group, when the economy gets tough, they, they trade down to fast serve from full serve restaurants. So all of that stuff, um, great macro signals, and we're definitely moving in that, and we're being asked about that. From, uh, from our clients and we're moving in that direction to create macro products. Yeah, and, and there are a number of, of sources out there. For example, there are services, uh, satellite services, that actually look at illumination data to, act, uh, to be able to judge economic activity mm. or, or other data sets out there that actually track um, inflation, uh, particularly in emerging markets where it's very difficult to get data. So, so there are a number of people who are trying to solve the problem of not just stock specific, but more macro and sector. Um, and I think if you get that macro call, then some of the issues around single stocks and old data kind of go away. We launched a product a couple of years ago, three years ago, which was essentially, you, you're familiar with the UMISH data, consumer sentiment. Well, we've now done that across with Ipsos, 23 countries. So now what we can do, and underneath that survey, there's 56,000 time series. So you can pretty much pick, a, pick across those markets whether a certain age group is likely to buy a car or not. Now that can really help you make a call on white goods or, 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 or whether you should invest in Ford, GM or whatever. So I think there are a few interesting data sets like that that allow you to kind of go above all of the noise and just go, actually we think that the consumer is feeling pretty good in Japan right now, so actually we need a consumer play in Japan. Right. Yeah, I, I, people are using our data in a similar way, just trying to get general demographic data or behaviors or that sort of thing. Uh, true macro data, quantitative data, has been around a lot longer than this sort of fundamental data. So people have been using uh, market data, trading data, that sort of thing for far longer than uh, fundamental alternative data. So it's a more mature market. It's not a market that we play in. We're not going to outquant the quants. Um, but that data definitely exists also. So you see estimates data, for example, um, is, is a new, fairly new phenomenon, but it's all part of a very macro picture. Right, right. So um, last question for you. You have a crystal ball. And I've asked this question of my panel yesterday. Where do you think the alternative data industry will be in five years, particularly from your perspective? I'm a strong proponent of that. The, the answer for the next five years or, or beyond that is investment professional plus data plus machine learning. That investment professional with machine and data beats machine alone, right? And beats investment professional alone. And that's where we're headed. So you're going to see machine learning more uh, a part of it. So getting into predictive analytics, but not just give me the signal, tell me the answer, working that in to the investment process. An investment professional knows what questions to ask and easily do that with the tools on the data and it's the blend of those three ingredients. So of course the data means blending multiple data sets but not having, the skill set is not, if you go back five years ago, the advantage was having data scientists and software engineers. So investment professionals saying, I need to hire a data scientist, I need a software engineer. That's not where it's going. The skill set is moving to how do you blend the financial analyst and the data analyst into a role. Forget about software engineering and data science. That's going to be done upstream. Don't develop an in-house tool. It's how do you evolve the skill set and work the combine the data analyst, financial analyst, and it could be a team, it could be an individual with that skill, and the advantage is not going to be that I have servers inside the company and I have software engineers who can manipulate terabytes of data. That was the advantage five years ago. That will not be the advantage five years from now or today. Right. So just following on, on from Bill's comment there, I think one of the things we're seeing is some of the technologies out there are becoming very powerful and easy to use. So we're looking at companies like H2O, 
and uh, data robot, they're deep learning systems, which is really mean, means that the, the gap between the two sigmas and the Bridgewaters and huge amounts of money that was required to build their platforms is going to narrow. So you're going to see, I think, a democratization of, of, of the data, and the systems are going to help do that. They will be deep learning based as opposed to time series. Um, that might be longer than five years, but I think, I, you know, I think that's something we're going to see certainly within 10 years. Okay. And I would say artificial intelligence is probably a layer that we'll start to see in, in five years. You know, think about it this way. If everybody has access to data and knows how to scale it, then there's no more alpha, right? You have to go to the next step, and I think that natural next step would be um, artificial intelligence where you can be far more predictive and get your arms around uh, far larger data sets and mm -hmm. manipulate them more effectively. Um, that's, the, uh, that's, that's the catch-22 of the data market is, um, you know, the, the more you use it to generate alpha, the less alpha you're going to have mm -hmm. if everybody's got it. Right. Well, I want to thank our panel uh, this morning. I thought you did a great job. Uh, if you can please join me in thanking them.